Greetings and peace. Blessings. Thank you for taking the time to come into our YouTube channel, the Ministry of the Real Truth. Where we today are going to go deeper into the uh, Book of Beginnings by Gerald Massey, uh, published around 1889. We've, by, we've gone past all the uh, comparative words in the Hebrew with the Egyptian and the Maori and the Egyptian comes out later, New Zealand Maori, indigenous people's language, te reo, comes out later. Okay, um, section 12, Hebrew cruxes with the Egyptian illustrations. According to Josephus, Josephus, the Egyptian writer, Apion most strenuously insisted that the Jews were of Egyptian origin. He affirmed that when they were cast out of Egypt, they still retained the language of that land. So they spoke Egyptian. He brings forward a proof which Josephus, Josephus, irately repudiate, refute it. Apion's account of the Jews was intended to satirize the worshippers of Sut, Typhon, the Aat, lepers, outcasts, and religiously unclean. These, he says, were driven out and as they were afflicted with the bubos, I guess that's like the earlier version of the bubonic plague. Maybe, maybe not. They rested on the seventh day and called it the Sabbath after the disease. Apion was playing upon words. Josephus, Josephus asserts of him. He then assigns a certain wonderful and plausible occasion for the name of Sabbath. For he says, when the Jews had travelled a six days journey, they had buboes in their groins, and on that account they rested on the seventh day that thus they preserved the language of the Egyptians and called that day the Sabbath for that melody of buboes in the groins was named sabbatosis by the Egyptians this grammatical translation of the word Sabbath either contains an instance of his great impudence or gross ignorance for the words Sabo and Sabbath are widely different from each other. The word Sabbath in the Jewish language denotes rest, but the word Sabo, as he affirms, denotes among the Egyptians the melody of Bubo in the groin. Apion was impudent or humorous enough, but not ignorant of a subject. He was right in asserting that the Hebrews retained the Egyptian language. Sabah or Saba in Egyptian means solace or rest. Sabatosis or Sabatis denotes some secret or veiled form of appropriate disease, just as in Latin bubo is the owl. Sabu signifying all that is profane, wicked, insulting and typhonian. This permitted a pun on the word Sabo. He was no doubt speaking of the botch of Egypt, the boil out of which broke the plague of leprosy. Leviticus 13.20 Tesh is red and Sabo Tesh the red boil, as Bubo is the red boil in the groin. Sabo Tesh might also have signified the Sabo or boil with The red spot indicative of leprosy. The Hebrew name for the botch, shachin, or shakin, and the Egyptian name for rest, respose. A light, cause to alight as 
scheme often another play upon a word with the same result these outcasts of Egypt were according to their own writings fearfully afflicted with the botch and leprosy diseases of this kind were attributed to Typhon who was called Baba the beast Ba is the beast Saba the beastly and those who had the diseases were worshippers of Sud and Sebek Sefek whose name is for ever associated with the Sabbath because it signifies number seven and the seventh day. The Hebrew which the afflicted fanatics kept so gloomily and in the secrecy of that gloom held up to heaven with piteous, piteous appeal of their sufferings and their sores a sad sight and a sorry subject for jest. There was moreover another covert meaning in the word sabbatosis. The subject has to be further deep dealt with and meanwhile it must suffice to say that Sabu, Egyptian, in the Egyptian, not only means to circumcise but to castrate. This was the earlier form of excision practiced in the worship of the genetrics by the Sabaeans who offered up their manhood to the motherhood. Sabu is the name of the ox or bullock, the castrated animal and of the eunuch. Seb Cronus was the castrator of his father. Sabu test means to excise the genitals. Test is the testicle and the very self. The disease, sabatosis, the botch of Egypt and the leprosy were evidently attributed to the Sabu in the sense and the Lord God of Sabaoth was thus not only the deity of the seventh day or seven stars but of the self-mutilated the Gali the Attis priests who became eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. The Hebrew Chethem is identical with the Egyptian Ketem Ketem to shut, lock and seal. It has the meaning of a seal to seal up and set a seal upon. The root is Ket to shut a seal and a signet. This will throw light on the form of the word as Chethen to give one's daughter in marriage to circumcise to be a bridegroom and continued we'll see whatever that means each is a form of sealing sealing ket is likewise to cut and cutting is the sealing by circumcision ket is cut and sealed to seal is to cut and seal is to cut the circumcised child is called Exodus 4.25 it's called metaphorically a bridegroom of blood that is sealed, cut and sealed with red with blood. Aben Ezra says the Jewish woman called a son when circumcised the bridegroom. Further, the seal and signet kit is a ring and the excised portion of the male is a circle, a wedding ring of the peculiar rite with which the covenant of the bridegroom is contracted and the sacred bond is sealed. So that could apply to the um, Biblical scriptures that those um, of God of Christ are um, circumcised, but not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Yeah. Um, in that sense, yeah, calling him the bridegroom, him the bridegroom, and the believers, his children, his sons, okay. the church, his bride, he's coming back for, okay, um, and so forth, so forth, okay, um, further the seal and signet kit is a ring and the excised portion of the male is a circle, a wedding ring of the peculiar rite with which the covenant of the bridegroom is contracted and the sacred bond is scaled, scaled, was that sealed? The word circumcision implies the excised circle. Also in Egyptian, the form hetan is a ring. The right was symbolically, the right was symbolical, and the ket ring is hieroglyphical. It is the type of reproduction. And if we read the matter hieroglyphic, hieroglyphically, the covenant of circumcision was instituted as the right of reproduction, swearing in of the male to produce his kind, and a protest against 
all unhappy practices of the earlier time. The proper period of the ceremony, the primitive races, was that of puberty, when the lessons were taught as in the Maori, the New Zealand indigenous people, <coughs> natives, young man making. The Hebrew circumcision for the second time probably denotes a second mode, the one in which the circle was excised for the first time in the solar cut cult. cult. Hence the foreskins, blah, blah, blah. Going into that, okay. It is a Jewish saying that the sun always shines on Saturday. Such sayings are a mode of mem memorizing facts that can only be read symbolically. Symbolically, of course, there is no direct meaning in such statement. But Saturday is the day of Sut, and Sut signifies a. Sunbeam. Suti, the sunbeam, has a determinative of the sun shining, and in the hieroglyphic sense, the sun always shines on the day of Sut or Saturday because it was, so to say, the earlier Sunday or Sabbath. Here is another Typhonian illustration. And the Mishnah. What's the Mishnah? Treatise, Cholin, Genesis. 14.6 In the Mishnah it is said If a person has slaughtered the animal with a handle, a hand sickle it is clean, kasher, and fit to be eaten Is that like kosher? Kasher? Kosher? And fit to be eaten The crooked hand sickle is a type of typhon Okay It is extant in the sickle of time, Cronus and in early form may be seen in the Egyptian scimitar called the Kepesh Kepesh a sickle shaped scimitar which bears the name of the hinder thigh a special ideography of Typhon and of the great bear the Kepesh is crooked and Kebab ke, Kebab Kab means bent crooked like Cam in English in other languages the origin of the shape is bent crooked or bicular depends on the turning round of the great bear the ancient genetrix who carried the loop shaped emblem as her sign of rule and measure. In later times, a moral or immoral meaning was read into the imagery, and the crooked or bent was made typical of perverseness, wryness, deflection from the straight rule and right line of rectitude and the strict accuracy of law, as represented by the stretched out piece of truth, personified in Marty, goddess of the twofold right. The calling serpent, the Nuti, had been an earlier type of the circular measure. Circular measure? And this was suspended together with the other crooked things by the straight rule, the straight knife. Cut the straight path and so forth. The Egyptian origin of Hebrew is well illustrated by the name of the wilderness is Midbar no satisfactory account of this word has ever been given yet been given the root mat in Egyptian Hebrew and Sanskrit has the meaning of measure and extent mat Egyptian or mat is likewise time to fix a point prove witness in the middle or midway pa ba is the name for a road and so forth okay it's over there bottom bit Egypt of all countries was the land of the desert boundary the narrowest strip of land in the world running betwixt such a double desert Hence the wilderness or waste was the nearest, most natural image of visible limits to the Egyptian mind. And the wilderness was with them a synonym, synonym of boundary. Okay.
Egypt? The river of Egypt, the inundation, the flood of Egypt, are called the Eo or Eo in Hebrew. That is the Egyptian Or, but Naha in the Hebrew, I guess, is the name of Nile, the actual river and flood of Egypt, as well as the river of mythological astronomy, the river of Eden, Genesis 2.10. The river of Egypt, Genesis 15:18. The typical river emphasized as Ta, or was it the? It was like Ta, probably something like Ta. No matter under what name, Ta River as Nile was religiously designated in Ur, in the Hebrew name of names for the river. The typical waters, the mythical floods, is that of the Nile, and the formation of the name is Egyptian. Nah. Hebrew is the plural for river. In Egyptian, Aru is the river. In Nai, Nai is the plural article. The river is now Aru, or the dual waters of the Nile. The two waters well, welling up, welling from the pool of the two troops, or the vase of Happy Mu. The Bayun waterer. The divinity of the Psalms who founds and establishes the earth on the floods. Psalms 24.2 does so on the Nile and its inundation which deposited the earth as Kepta. Surely then it must be an Egyptian divinity who is celebrated in the Psalms. I'm trying to get my head around that one. Floods instead of the Nile and the formation of the name is Egyptian. Okay, um, according to jo Josephus, Kimchi the Seventy and Ben Sira the river Gihon or whatever that is in the Hebrew of the Genesis is the Nile which flows through all the lands of Cush, sometimes spelt with the sea, the southern lands. It is not the narrator it is not that the narrator thought of the origin of the Nile as being in Asia as first suggests, but because the narrative was Egyptian at first. The imagery is Egyptian from the first and the riddle of the mythical commencement can only be solved in relation to their localities as Egyptian. This is the river that runs from the south through all the lands of Kush. Kamit on the river Gihon says the people of Goyam, Goyam called the Kauli Nile by that name. The Hebrew name of the river in full is the Gichon, i.e. the Gikhan, an Assyrian cinnamon synonym for the river Euphrates. If we refer this back to Egyptian, Kich denotes the tidal water, and Ken means the interior, the lake, the southern, Kent. Thus, Kich Ken is the tidal river of the lands of the south. The Nile of Egypt flows from south to north, but the celestial Nile was figured in Kepesh. Kep the north and only in Egyptian imagery and by aid of the Egyptian naming can this Kapish of the southern land be reconciled with the na same name naming Kapish of the celestial north and etc etc where the land of Kush Ethiopia was yet to be the north of them and Kush, Kush or Kapish was their north and so forth uh, the Nile thus identified as the terrestrial, terrestrial Gihon includes the celestial river and proves the mythos to be Egyptian. Is he talking about the flood? Because uh, as the flood being Egyptian, 
right? Because earlier on, they stated that uh, these Jews actually learnt the language of the Egyptians. So they spoke that language, and when they left, they were speaking Egyptian. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around that. Are they like saying that that so called global flood was actually denial? It was all Egyptian. Everything came from the Egyptian first, because when they came out, they're speaking Egyptian, writing Egyptian. So it was an Egyptian. So it has a completely different meaning. Um, Bible wise, it's not really the Hebrew, it's Egyptian. It, it first came from the Egyptians. I'm not sure on that one. You'd have to look at it yourself and work it out for yourself. It just gives me that funny feeling that's what he's hinting at. He could be right, he could be wrong. Transformation shall I see God? Let's go back there a bit. See what that actually said. Uh, Egyptian, Af, Egyptian, the flesh will account for the Hebrew, the, the skin will cover and best to transfer or transform, pass from one place or shape to another. With Ah, uh, the lightness will redeem, render the, the Hebrew Hasa, Basa. The fundamental sense of the passage then is, and though my likeness, okay, I'll go back up here, a bit further back up here, because it says here, Hebraists have not been sufficiently acquainted with the exact meaning of the word, I don't know how you say this, N-Q-P-H, in the Hebrew, to correctly translate the original of the passage. And, and I, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Uh, what's that? Job 19.26. Sarah? Hmm, can't be set. So small point there. Yeah, Job 16.26. Uh, Some kind of destruction is intended, but it cannot be by worms. It is true that the Arabic, whatever that word there is, has the meaning has the meaning of worm eaten. But the missing sense and true form of the destruction will be found in the Egyptian nikfi to calcine or be calcined. The reading then will be, and though this thing my cover be calcined yet in my bazaar shall I see God Alpha, Egyptian the flesh will account for the Hebrew of her, the skin or cover and best to transfer or transform pass from one place or shape to another with ah the lightness will render the Hebrew bazaar the fundamental sense of the passage then is and though my lightness of the flesh be calcined yet in my type of transference hmm kind of confusing here okay uh, or transformation shall I see God a mode of description according to the Egyptian doctrine of Kif uh, Kif uh. okay it goes on okay I'm trying to find things that are relevant Okay, the word Salah, 
has caused much perplexity to commentators. It is frequently found in the Psalms. It only occurs three times elsewhere and then in the hymn or psalm. It is generally accepted as a sign of silence, rest, or a note importing a pause, as if it meant the singer was to rest whilst or whilst the instrumental music went on. There is a fuller phrase in Psalm 9.16 where instead of the usual salah, the note is whatever that is in Hebrew. Heguin Heguin Salah. Jacentia suggests that this should be apparently this should apparently be rendered instrumental music pause. But if as is here contended the oldest of the Psalms of David belong to the books of Tart, Egyptian ought to be enable us to settle the matter. Selah with the R in place of L will be Sir. Sir means something sacred, involved, reserved and very privately personal. R denotes a salute. Sir R or Selah is our most private and personal salute. We do not get silence specified as one of the meanings of the word but this may be gathered from the others. Whilst Huknu is to supplicate Huknu read phonetically will be Hukun. The Egyptian hek has the same meaning in the Hebrew chug to charm or the muttering of enchanters. Okay, and so forth. Uh, which is un herheb, un herheb in Egyptian signifies the show face festivals when there was an appearance or exhibition of the god to whom the offerings were made. So in the margin, Exodus. 22.11 where we find little leakings out of the primary sense Moses besought fa the face panim in the Hebrew of the Lord and the faces of the Lord is the same as the shoe bread or bread of faces panim the bread of the show face festival hence the relation of the shoe bread and bread of faces to Moses beseeching the face to show Tubal is a Hebrew type name for the metallurgist metallurgist Tubal the son Oh yeah, he's uh, Tubal. Yeah, he, the guy has Tubal Cain. I think it's Lamech like or something like that. In Genesis. Of Japheth is a metal worker. Still, yeah, Japheth. Still earlier, Tubal, Tubal Cain is an instructor of every artificial and brass and iron. That's the uh, artist, creator, uh, maker of brass and the iron. This, be it noted in the seventh generation of men. In Egyptian, Tub or Teb means to purify and refine by fire and so forth cam is black and to create in arabic to arise to commence and so forth so yeah commit 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 black soil land of the black soil um what's this in Israel, the Kimarim were degraded as the priests of an illegal Jehovah worship. Hosea, Hosea, ten five, and of the golden calf, the symbol of the Elohim who led them out of, up out of Egypt. The Assyrian kings used to keep astronomers who pro prognosticated from eclipses. Okay, it's going on about these words. It sounds like it's all coming from the Egyptian. If they were um, slaves in Egypt for that claim period of time and it as this beginning of this book states they came out and they had they were well versed in the Egyptian language etc etc then it's all coming from them uh, from the Egyptians it seems Or 
all there is secret, sacred, mystical, the innermost of warm mystery, apparently including some relationship to or commune with the dead, as expressed by the Egyptian word shit. In the Aramaic, they have shit, but it's S H E T, that was a name of someone in Genesis who um, escapes me at the moment. The Hebrew sword. Yeah, it was C S H E T was the uh, Aramaic word for a name of a man, a certain guy in Genesis. Uh, my gosh. Still trying to find a, a relationship between a comparison between the uh, Egyptian and the Hebrew that proves that the Hebrew Hebrews or these that came out of Egypt um, first wrote all in Egyptian because that's what they spoke in the middle of the desert, you know wrote it all down as all Egyptian before it became um, Hebrew at some point okay there's a lot of information there there's probably a lot to um, try and take in all at once I thought I just saw something about Tiamat What's this? Uh, on the authority of a word in the Greek, I Ionios found in Greek. Human beings are damned forever for all eternity and there is no other foundation for the doctrines of the eternal punishment with which foolish fanatics threaten all who do not think as they do. And yet Ionios has no other basis than the Eon, a cycle of time. This is the Egyptian An or Han, the cycle with the meanings of repetition, with the meaning of repetition. The eternal was based on periodic repetition. Millions of times is a formulae of eternity, and four times the equivalent of the four cardinal points of the circle is equally an equivalent of ever. The symbol of these words meaning ever forever is the circle. Here, in Egyptian is Egyptian for the eternal, and it means an age of eon or an, a cycle of time. The eternal is eonian at last and was based on and was based on was birth of time the day he who lived and died or alternatively forever not a conception of something abstract and independent of time and space the perpetual is a periodic okay it is said of the hidden god in the inscription of El Kaga he has not come out of a womb he has come out of cycles and the circle is the image of the cycle the mode of continu continuity was by transformation, one circle running into another. Yes. There is no other basis than the cycle continually renewed for the Hebrew everlasting. Ad or God means ever and ever, everlasting, eternal, eternity, perpetually. The same word signifies until or meantime, as yet, how long, and so long, as in blah, blah, blah. Okay, um... Kadim for Eden is the Egyptian Katam or circle. Uh, um, um, Egyptian. 
Egyptian signifies belonging to and in the place of in the place and M Egyptian right there is signifies belonging to and in is the place the paradise Eden or circle of transformation Kippa and renewal in time where the perpetual going forth from of old of the Messiah son are manifested in the circle without beginning or end hence eternally he who is periodically reborn from Avlam Kivlam or Kip Kipra yeah. and so forth there's uh, quite a lot there another form of the Semtat or symbol of the ever the established forever is the tat sign of the ta the fourfold cross or cardinal points where the solar circle was formed semi means to encircle semi tat is to establish the circle the sign of ever okay. the first solar circle was framed in two halves the upper and lower heavens in the two halves of the moon these two halves joined in one to make the whole and the twin total is an Egyptian Timat Timat also furnishes a Hebrew word for ever continual ever more and always as Tamid Timat means a complete circle and it's identical with our word timed so it's nothing to do with um, Tiamat is it? hmm so that's all to do with the circle. It's just a book of Enoch. Enoch, the record of the luminaries of heaven together with their generations, classes, periods, powers and names. Okay. <laughs> What's this? The tu, tu a ut survives in English as the twat, a name of the feminine organ. Okay, so that's where these British got it from, the twat. But they say sometimes they say you twat. Okay, it was here that the tomb and womb were one. Hence the tuat is also the grave or hell. Psalms oh, is that fifty how's that? Eighty I'm not really sure what that is, eighty thirty. Psalms eighty thirty. <laughs> twat. Funny. Um So that's where that word came from. The the Egyptian tuat became the British twat. Okay. Uh, Collar hieroglyphic with all its significance passed into Israel as we learn by the one by the denunciation of Isaiah. The collar has various names. Kek is one, Kakri is some kind of necklace. Art Kek are neck chains. The de determinative of these is the sign of horns and testes. This indicates the nature of the restraining collar. The collar with nine points alternates with one of the thirteen, the same number. Is that of the knotted loops around the Assyrian Asherah or the grove, signifying the 13 periods to the year which have but one original in nature? The Kek collar is likewise called Baba, that is Typhon. Typhon the Red was the adversary looked upon in later restraint. The collar was a symbol of this 
hence the kick collar and a kick the dragon or typhon are cinema synonyms there is a vulgar expression still in use go home and tell your mother to chain up ugly <laughs> insult translated into egyptian that would mean typhon baba the beast who was chained up with the collar number nine or the menat collar number 10 according to solar or lunar reckoning this is enough to show the symbolic nature of the collar emblem and account for the indignation of the Jewish Protestants at the tricking out of the daughters of Israel in such ornaments. These collars are called sweet jewels. The chains are sweet balls, which can be explained by the collar with nine boo-boo or balls worn by Isis. The tinkling ornaments about their feet are gekes, one with the Egyptian kek, and the art kek or chain for the ankle. Hmm. Interesting stuff. What did I see? So something about teeth. Go back here. What was it about teeth? Asbu is the place of rest and the asb is the type of this hence the seat. The seat also shows a relation to the woman in labour. The seat or asib had various forms based on the feminine type. The kevanim made by the woman of Israel represents the goddess with the symbolical seat. The kun image. Kun image. The house of the seat, asib, is identified with the house of Ashtaroth as and his Egyptian being names of the seat of the bearer the absence of the seat in Hebrew has misled the translators of Isaiah Is that eight? Ho Hosea 845 Bel Belf down Nebo stoopeth the idols at Zeb were upon the beast and upon the cattle your carriages heavy laden a burden to their weary beast all the missing sense is restored by reading their seats as Adzeb instead of their idols. Isaiah identifies the nature of the Adzeb with the seat of the beast. In Egyptian, Hes, the seat is also the calf or heifer. So the Adzeb goes with the heifer and calf in Israel. Israel slideth back as a black backsliding heifer. Ephraim is joined to the Adzeb. Adzeb. Again, the Etsib is coupled with the calf or of Samaria. Is it Isaiah eight four five? And again, the Etsib is one with the calves. The craftsmen have made the Etsib, and they say of them, "Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves." That is, kiss the seat as in the witches. Okay, witches. Sabbath, the symbol of the motherhood. Hmm. So yeah, it's basically relating everything to, <coughs> as the cover says, Egyptian origins in the Hebrew, Akedo, Assyrian, <coughs> Akedo, Assyrian, and Maori. Yeah, it all originates from the Egyptian. Yeah, Egyptian origins in the Hebrew, Akedo, Assyrian, and Maori. That'd be Akkadian, Assyrian, and Maori. Okay, 
So uh, I think we'll stop there because it could go on forever. It's quite an extensive book. Uh, so go get a hold of it at uh, archive.org or the Wayward Machine and uh, download it and have a look at it yourself. Check it out yourself. It's quite a massive read. Right, probably spend months trying to read it. Uh, yeah, good luck to you.